for this cultural Thursday um, and to introduce our artist for tonight I uh, have the honor of um, introducing to you the cultural counselor of the French Embassy, Mr. Jean-Jacques Fauquet. And I will have the greater honor to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Michael Cousteau. Uh, I will say just a few words. Uh, Michael Cousteau is a French conductor who established himself internationally as a musician of uh, unusual vers versatility, conducting uh, operatic and symphonic uh, repertoire ranging from the Baroque uh, on period instruments to contemporary works. Thank you for shutting down the lights. And, <laughs> <laughs> In Europe, uh, Mr. Cousteau has been invited to conduct the Orchestre National de Lyon, Orchestre National de Montpellier, He's been conducting in Nancy, in Cannes, in Luxembourg, in Berlin, in London, so in many places uh, all over Europe. He appears uh, regularly in China since 2012, uh, including concert with the orchestra of Wuhan uh, Opera House. Um, he's been conducting the China National Symphony, uh, Symphony Orchestra at the prestigious Beijing Modern uh, Music Festival. He was invited uh, by the Sichuan Conservatory of Music. So, uh, great uh, big experience in uh, Asia. In the Philippines as well, uh, he, he, well, first in, in the rest of Asia, in other countries, he's been uh, conducting in Vietnam, in Bangkok, the Bangkok Symphony Orchestra, the Nusantara Symphony Orchestra in Indonesia, and of course already in Philippines, uh, with the Philippines uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. So it's uh, uh, an old uh, relation already that uh, he's having with the uh, musician of this uh, orchestra. Um, just another world, he, he, he trained as a cellist and pianist from early chi childhood. During his uh, studies, he was uh, honored with awards for conducting music analysis, orchestration, and music composition at the Conservatoire de Reims and Conservatoire of Paris. Uh, tonight, I would like to, to add, uh, well, to thank him very sincerely and uh, heartfully for being here with us. Uh, to thank him for his uh, commitment and for his uh, dedication and for all he's uh, giving us uh, during his stay. Not only the concert, the great concert of tomorrow night at the CCP, but uh, also for this uh, conference tonight. I'm sure you will enjoy and we will learn a lot about uh, Berlioz and uh, also for the master classes he's been giving because he's already always uh, willing to have a, uh, additional uh, experiences and relations with musicians and young conductors in the countries he's visiting so thank you michael kusto thank you very much so thank you so this concert could be an introduction for the concert of tomorrow where i hope you will come because tomorrow it's a kind of portrait of Berlioz. But it's a very special portrait. It's a portrait of Berlioz through the friends he had. Because Berlioz was a totally central figure in the history of music and in the history of Romanticism. So tomorrow, you will be able to hear a uh, Wagner Ouverture Tristan, uh, Berlioz Harold in Italy, which is a piece with solo viola, which I speak of, of course, for this evening. Uh, the love scene of Romeo and Juliet from Berlioz, taken from the Shakespeare play, and Les Preludes de Liszt. Why this connection between all these pieces? Because, you know, uh, Wagner was very impressed by the Romeo and Juliet from Berlioz. He was so impressed that the beginning of the second part of, no, at the beginning of the beginning of Tristan is very close to the beginning of the second part of Romeo and Juliet. And your Wagner was somebody very selfish. And uh, he always, he, well, he was a genius, obviously, but okay. But in this case, he gave to Berlioz a score of Tristan and Isolde, 
saying to the unforgettable author of Romeo and Juliet, from the author of Tristan and Isolde. So, which is a, a very rare example of generosity in, uh, in Wagner's life. So, this is why we begin with Tristan. Then, I speak about the concept of tomorrow, yes? <laughs> then, Liszt, which was a very good friend of Wagner and of Berlioz, invited Berlioz several times in Weimar to conduct. And Liszt made the piano version of Harold in Italy. The piece of Berlioz will be played tomorrow. So, of course, there is a big connection between them. So, after Tristan and Harold in Italy on the intermission, we will have the love scene of Romeo and Juliet, which is connected with, um, the, with the Tristan, and the Les Préludes de Liszt, which is an absolute great masterpiece of Liszt. And um, a little cherry on the cake is that, in fact, um, Berlioz wanted to, conduct, to, to make the Harold in Italy for, Liszt, uh, for Paganini, you know, the very famous violinist. Paganini was a superstar. Exactly like Liszt was a superstar for the piano. He had a, a lot of money. And he wrote a letter to, to uh, Berlioz, Maestro Berlioz, I buy myself a new viola. You know, the viola is a violin, a bigger a violin, a little bit more with a deeper sonority. So I would be glad if you wrote me a concerto. Okay. So Berlioz wrote a, a, a kind of concerto. Of course, you will see that Berlioz never, never in all his musical work did something that was done before. So, of course, he didn't work a concerto. A concerto. You know what is a concerto? A concerto is for solo instrument with orchestra, and the superstar is a soloist. He wrote a piece called Harold in Italy, which we'll read tomorrow, I hope, with the, the story of Harold. Harold is a hero from Byron. And so, Harold going in Italy. But the main character in this piece maybe is the orchestra. And Harold is one, so it's a kind of hero, but it's not a hero like a soloist in a concerto. So anyway, when Berlioz showed to Liszt the score, he said, uh uh, well, there is no solo, there is no virtuosity. Well, maybe I won't play this. And in fact, Berlioz knew, because he wrote a letter to his editor saying, well, I'm not sure that, that Liszt will accept, uh, that Paganini will accept to play it. Okay, anyway, so okay, so finally, Paganini didn't, didn't play this piece. But at the premiere, Paganini was there. And he was totally convinced by the piece. So after the concert, he went on the stage and he, he kneeled to Berlioz and said, you are the new Beethoven. When he gave me, he gave him a check of 100,000 francs, which is a lot of money, a lot of money. And with this money, Berlioz could wrote Romeo and Juliet. So, there is also not only a link between Tristan and, and uh, Romeo and Juliet, between Liszt, Prelude, and Harold in Italy, because Harold in Italy, well, the piano version was written by Liszt. Be careful, because after I will ask you questions to know if you follow it. <laughs> <laughs> but there is also a connection between Romeo and Juliet and Harold in Italy, because thanks to the money that Paganini gave to Berlioz, he could vote Romeo and Juliet. Okay. So this was a little appetizer for tomorrow, so I really hope you will come. It's my third uh, collaboration with the PPO, it was in 2009 and 2012. It's very difficult music to play, and they play so well. But it's so, so, it's masterpiece, one after the other, maybe it's a little bit, you know, it's like a, a meal, maybe it's a, a little bit of too big meal. We were very, how do you say in English, in Abelis, you have to we wanted to, mm, oh, this, oh yes, oh, this, oh yes, oh this, this, this. Okay. okay, it's a huge program, it's absolutely beautiful music, so I hope you will be there tomorrow. This was the introduction. Okay, let's speak about Berlioz. So, Berlioz was a very special guy. He was, in fact, the archetypal of the romantic per per person. And I will explain you why. First, speaking about his life, and then, of course, make you hear music, of, uh, part of this music. So, Berlioz was born, was born in 83. He was a son in a little city uh, near Grenoble, uh, under La Côte Saint-André, where now there is a very famous um, uh, festival, Berlioz Festival, a little city, 
and his father was a doctor, a very open-minded doctor, and he wanted, uh, so he gave a kind of musical education to his son. He wrote a book uh, about medicine, which was very, very interesting, and of course he wanted that his, his son become a doctor to take his place after his death. And his mother, Belio's mother, was much less open-minded. Okay. Then, Berlioz discovered at the age of seven his love for music. And uh, it was a disaster for the family. Well, for the father it was okay, but the idea that he becomes a composer, uh, a musician, an artist. You know, you know that one hundred years before, artists were considered as prostitutes. And uh, they, they, you know, Mozart was not, was not uh, Berlioz, but, uh, because he was a musician. Anyway. It was in, in, uh, in 1812, so people were a little bit more open-minded, let's say. Okay, so Berlioz wanted to make music, the family wanted him to be a doctor. So he went to Paris to study medicine. But in fact, he spent much more time to go to concerts, to <laughs> opera houses, to theater, without saying to anybody. And he knew so well that, for example, when he went to operas, he says to friends, okay, if you want to see this, this opera, you have to sit in this seat, or in this seat. Here you will hear this, here you will hear this. Or also, don't go to, see, to hear this. It's a big success, but it's just easy listening music, no interest at all. He began to have contact with the musicians themselves in the orchestra. And uh, 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 so, he, so, so he was uh, an expert. Then, of course, he wanted to study music itself. And in fact, at the beginning of his early age, he was a self-made man. How did he learn without going in any conservatory? Because the father won't give him money to, to study music. First, he went to the National Library in Paris, which still exists, where there was a lot of manuscripts, scores. So when you, when you, when you knew music, you can read a score without listening. This is a... Uh, a quality of musician. So, he reads the operas of Gluck. Gluck is a composer uh, from the, from, he, was a, he was a teacher of, the, of Marie Antoinette. He was German and had French, and he made a lot of operas, and he had a, a very good sense of drama. So, Berlioz um, was fond of Gluck on, on of this uh, capacity to make theater in the music. Then, at those times, uh, people became, uh, be, uh, began to play Beethoven. So I have to tell you something. In the, in the early 20s in Paris, uh, people were crazy about operas. And they didn't care about symphonic music. So music without voice. Even Stendhal, another writer of Le Rouge et Noir, he wrote that he will give every bird everything for Rossini. And the fact Beethoven, well, he just doesn't care. But a group of small musicians from the Opera House built an orchestra called La Société des Conservatoires with a conductor called Abenek. And this man made the premiere of the Beethoven symphonies in France. And for, um, for Berlioz, it was a huge shock. The fact that the symphonies, no singers could say so much. And it's very, it's very interesting because after, when, when Berlioz wrote his first big masterpiece, La Symphonie Fantastique, it was conducted by Amadek. And then the piece we may be here tomorrow, which is his second masterpiece after chronologically, uh, Harold in Italy, it was also conducted by Amadek. So you know, Berlioz he had a big power of, of, of conviction. So he convinced this conductor to conduct his own pieces a little bit later. So, just to, to explain, Gluck for the dramatic sense, Beethoven for the ability to make, speak the instruments as operas. And the third god for Berlioz was Shakespeare. So, Shakespeare, uh, uh, he says <laughs> that Shakespeare changed his life. Changed, so, why? Because he discovered that in Shakespeare, you can make a play with the grotesque and the sublime. 
with normal people and kings. At those times, uh, in the French classical theater, we spoke about the unité de lieu, the same place, unité d'action, one action, et unité de temps, only in one day. This was the famous rules for French theater. Also, for painting, we had very big rules. It has to be uh, referred to all times, to kings, to things like that. So, at the same period, Victor Hugo discovered Shakespeare as well. And he, he wrote uh, a piece called Cromwell with an introduction saying his new conception of theater, which was in fact a manifesto for romanticism. This was in 1827. Then, in 1830, Victor Hugo made a play called Hernani, and the people began to, 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 to fight in the theater, to, 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 you know, to, to walk the stairs. But it was such a scandal, because it was the first French play based on this idea coming from Shakespeare. This was for literature. For music, it's the same. Berlioz wrote his Symphonie Fantastique, and it was a huge scandal. Because on, then we will enter into the symphony fantastic. Because in this symphony fantastic, he invents new concepts. First of all, he make he asks the people to read a text. You can have a look. So this text is a kind of autobiographical text. Uh, it's a story of a man who is in love with a woman, and is so despair. Uh, that she doesn't love him, that he had some uh, uh, strange experience. The first movement, daydreams. Second, the second movement, you will read it at home. A ball, then in the middle, then march of the scaffold, and then Sabbath night dream. So, it's written, you know, you see, mm, it, it was written that this text has to be given to the audience before the concert. So, this idea that a music will be based on the text, it was totally new. Then it becomes what we call symphonic poem. For example, the poem, the Liszt prelude, that's what also a connection. The prelude of Liszt that I will conduct tomorrow, it's also based on the poem. But the first musician to have the idea to put to make a connection between text and music, it was Berlioz. So, this was the first incredible thing by the Symphony Fantastique. But after which we got the music, of course. The second thing is that, in fact, the hero of this is the composer itself. I mean, in Mozart's time, or in a, even in the early Romantic, like Beethoven, the, 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 the goal of the music was not to put yourself in, in the middle of, to say, look at me, I'm suffering. I'm the, uh, or you, will, you will communicate with, with, my, with, with my suffering. This was a totally new idea. And this is an idea of values in music. In fact, it comes from a period a little bit before. The first it was good, with the suffering of the young Werther. So it's a suffering of a man in love with a woman, and the man finally killed himself. And it was in the end of the 18th century, and this novel uh, provoked a, a, a suicide epidemic in, in the in young generation. Then the other was Chateaubriand, another French literature, who speaks about the spleen. So the spleen is, 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 is when you are nostalgic, uh, where I am, what should I watch I do in life? Uh, will, I, will I be loved? Well, all these kind of things. Teenagers problem. But anyway, <laughs> this was the spleen um, was um, something in the in the in the air. But Berlioz took it as the main subject of his first masterpiece. So you have to realize the the amazing um, exhibitionism of this story. Because not only he speaks about himself, 
But why did he want this? Because in 87, a theatre troupe from England came at the Paris Theatre of Odeon to play Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare plays. And Berlioz fell in love with Harriet uh, Smith, the, the, the famous actress, who, who was the actress of Ophélie in Hamlet. So can you imagine? He wrote a whole symphony of 50 minutes to catch the love of this woman. And it worked. She came, and they were married two years after. Just to tell you that uh, it's not um, the first anecdote about uh, Berlioz's ability to love. Berlioz won a competition. It was the Prix de Rome. This competition in France was very, very important. It was for sculpture, for music, uh, and for literature. So you have to make, um, uh, to compose a musician, you have to compose a, a, a piece about a subject. You were locked in a room during one month without any possibility to go out. The food was given by you like this, you know? And you have to walk, and after one month, you give your piece, and you could win the first prize. Anyway, Berlioz did it three times. Why? First, he didn't, he, he, he didn't want it, and also he wanted to show to his mother that he's not uh, nobody. And he, he didn't win it. He won it only the, the fifth time, when he made something which is not Berlioz at all. When he made something banal, which was okay for the, you know, for the teachers. Anyway, why I tell you that? Because he had a fiancé, Camille Molk, a pianist, a very famous pianist. And then he go to Rome because he won the prize. So he went to Rome, two years, in the Villa Medicis. If you know Rome, it's an amazing villa in Rome, which belongs to France, to the Academy of France. And, uh, okay, and then he heard that Camille Molk <laughs> had a new fiancé, Mr. Pleyel, which was a pianist, the founder of the very famous piano, and uh, I know it was a son of Pleyel, so probably he will be very rich. What did Berlioz? This was three years before the story with uh, with uh, Odeon Théâtre in uh, 1827. He bought he bought himself two guns, a maid a maid costume, and poison because okay he did a little bit of medicine studies so he knew, and he decided to go to Paris. To, 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 um, to be as a maid, to kill Mrs. Molk, to kill Mr. Uh, Pleyel, and if it's not efficient, to, to put some poison or to kill himself after. It was uh, totally uh, I mean, he organized. So he went to Italy, he was in Rome, he went to Paris, but then in Nice, he began to swim, he began to see the sea, and say, okay. Uh, maybe I will finish my life in a pretty new jail. Maybe the world has something to hear from my music. And he didn't execute his project. <laughs> Thanks God. Yeah. So, so, I mean, his musical education, the way he was a self made man, his life, because he had a totally bohemian life. He had no money. So how did he earn money at the beginning of his life? He became a very famous critic. He is a very, very great, a very good writer. And also he began to go to sing in chorus. But he was, uh, uh, he was ashamed by the fact to sing in, in this type of operas. Because, as I told you, French people were crazy about operas. But in fact, they were crazy not about good operas. They were crazy about easy listening music, easy listening operators. Operate. If you are looking now in the front of